you'll see these clickbait articles like train how Justin Verlander trains or whatever. Like you don't need to necessarily train how a big leaguer trains because they're at this level of their progression. And so they're doing much more advanced and specialized things for their body. How you should train as a complete beginner is different. Welcome everybody. My name is Scott Hassey. This is episode 18 of ITTV. We've got Ben Brewster of Tread Athletics here with us. Excited to get into it with him. Before we do that, I want to go over a quick few things. So if you are not following us on social media, it is just at Indiana Twins across the board on YouTube. It's youtube.com slash Indiana Twins. So go ahead and subscribe there. Um, we will have this uploaded to YouTube. We'll have timestamps within the next day or two. To, so you guys can kind of skip around in the episode. So when I go over the overview, if there's something that you really want to hear about, you can kind of uh, do the, it's like a show more under YouTube under the video and you'll just be able to click around the timestamps. So I think everyone appreciates that we do that. Um, I think that's it pretty quick. So just an overview of what we're going to cover with Ben. We're going to go over his story, which I think is probably the most important thing that we're going to cover today because we have a lot of players and even parents too that can relate to a lot of his story. We're going to go over kind of just my idea is we're going to go from high school to college to pro ball to now his work with Tread Athletics and just kind of ask some questions in between and then talk about nutrition, training, and we'll go from there. So with all that said, Ben, let's kick it off. I actually want to preface this with, was your forum name Lanky Lefty? It was. Okay, That's because when I – when I had Kyle Bodie on here a couple weeks ago, I told him to prep for the interview. I had looked back through all the forums on all kinds. Of, there was Let's Talk Pitching, Baseball Fever, High School, Web, something or other. And I remember being in those like in the last 10 years. And so it was like a trip down memory lane. What, what I was your name? Seeing... I, might, I might remember you. Oh, I was just a viewer. I didn't okay. really contribute okay. too much. At that 10 years ago, I was like, these guys are way smarter than I am or more dedicated like yourself. I was like, God, this guy is posting every single – workout that he's doing it was nuts so I remember seeing you in there and then to see you start to come out with programs and stuff and your um, ebook that we'll talk about later it was really cool to see and kind of follow along as you started to become more and more public and go off of everything so let's let's kick it off there and then into high school and let's just hear a little bit about that time frame yeah so it's it's crazy to think about the those forums because there's so many of so many of the people that are kind of forefront of the industry right now started quote unquote, in the, in the forums 10, well, maybe 15 years ago, even uh, like 12 years ago. Um, like Bodie, Kyle Bodie was there. I remember Lance Wheeler was in there. Paul Nyman was in there. He obviously had set pro and he had his own private set pro forums. Um, so I was in those as well. Didn't really get on the baseball fever forums too much. Um, but again, like most people nowadays don't realize there's so much information now. Back then there was really nothing, right? You, you Googled how to throw harder. It was like Dick Mills pitching.com. You know, don't strength train, don't long toss, just, you know, everything specificity. It was Stephen Ellis, like buy my tough cuff book. And it was just very basic, like lifting. Um, it was set pro, which was Paul Nyman. That was it. Like it they hadn't even been Ron Wolforth yet. It was very bare bones. And so, um, you know, people were going off of like Nolan Ryan's, you know, pitching Bible or Sandy Koufax's book. Like there was very little out there, surprisingly, 10, 15 years ago. Um, so everything's really exploded. Uh, in the past 10 years to where I don't think people realize that. So I was on these forums, like now kids go on Instagram and they're just like distracted by all this nonsense and all these crap accounts and, um, you know, baseball fan accounts. And it's, it's just oversaturated. Um, back then there were a couple forums. That was it. And so I, I think that's, that's where people gravitated towards to learn. But even so it was like, you had to figure out so much of it on your own. It, I had to fill in the gap so much at that point. Um, but if you want me to start in high school, like, I wasn't the kid who like knew he wanted to play necessarily pro baseball his whole life. Um, I was always a pretty decent athlete, but never, you know, played hyper competitive travel baseball or anything. I was, you know, just played my local rec leagues and I was decent. I wasn't always the best player, but I was pretty athletic. Um, freshman year of high school, I didn't go to a particularly good, you know, sports high school. So I made the varsity team, but I wasn't that good. I threw 70 to 73. Um, and I got hit around a little bit by the, the upperclassmen that year. So I was like, well, damn, this is the first time I've ever not been the best player or one of the best players on the team without trying. Like, it was, a, it was kind of a wake-up moment because I never experienced failure. Like, I was a smart kid. I was pretty athletic. And so I reach high school. I'm, you know, starting to gain a little bit of maturity, um, you know, go through puberty. I went from 5'7 to, like, 6'3 over one summer. So I just, like, sprouted, and I was 150 pounds. 
Um, I was running cross country at the time in the falls because I was told that that would get my legs in shape for baseball. So that goes to show you like the state of the baseball world back then. Like this is even before Cressy started writing about how distance running is terrible for pitchers. Like people didn't even know it, know that um, 15 years ago. It was still, that was still the norm and, and the, the common myth. So I was 6'3", 150, running cross country, you know, on these forums, no idea what to do. But I had a, you know, I got hit around a little bit that first year as a freshman. And I don't know what, I don't know what it was, but there was, there was basically just one day where it was a turning point and it went from, you know, baseball just is what it is to this is going to be my new mission in life. I decided like one random day I just woke up and I decided I want a purpose in life. I'm not just going to, you know, I was kind of just going through the motions, like, you know, doing well in school for my parents, like just kind of going through the motions. And I decided I'm going to live life for what I want. Um, I'm going to set some goals and I'm going to just go after them and see what happens. So I set the goal. I started a online pitching blog on that forum. Uh, I titled it, you know, journey to uh, B1 college baseball and beyond. And I was throwing like 70 at the time. So I think that was the first entry. It's like, here's where I'm at. I'm 6'3", 150. You know, I can do 12 pull-ups. You know, this is my mile time. I can run a mile in six minutes. Like, I can do how many sit-ups in a minute. Like, it was completely the metrics that don't matter at all. Um, but it's, it's cool to look back and see kind of that starting point and how uh, motivated and enthusiastic I was and how detail-oriented I was. I committed to the process I was having no idea what I was doing. But that's the only thing I did have, which is that, like, I was going to take a detail-oriented approach and I was going to just learn and try a bunch of stuff. Um, so that's the only thing I got right back then is that I was crazy driven and I was going to take a detail oriented approach and measure everything. That's like all I got right. But the actual nuts and bolts of how to get there, I had no idea what I was doing. So basically from that one day where I had that shift in my mind, I started reading everything I could. I was studying three, four, five hours a day. I was reading, I was printing out all the forums from SetPro. Like five years back, I was just printing out pages and pages and pages and filling binders and reading them, posting and probably annoying everybody on the forums because I was asking a lot of questions and, you know, posting videos and, you know, Paul Iman said to, you know, throw with your shirt off so you could see your scaps moving. So I was throwing my shirt off this 15 year old kid, like super skinny, like throwing 70, doing all these crazy drills, like changing my mechanics every other day. Um, so that's basically where it all started. But um, I would say as far as influences, Nyman was kind of that first influence of, you know, understanding look, velocity is a very important metric. Um, that kind of, that gave me a direction from the start. It's like, look, if you're 95 mile an hour lefty, you have a very good shot of playing as long as you want to play in baseball. And that, back then 95 as a lefty was like hundred is now. So it's a little bit different. Um, but it was like, if you can do that, you're going to have a, you're going to have a place in baseball as long as you want. While you're doing that, you can be learning to learn to pitch, learning off speed, like all that stuff. But so that basically set the top of the pyramid, like that set what I was shooting for. Um, another observation I had from the start and I, I again was influenced by Nyman from this standpoint is like look it's it's basically just a physics problem and I was a little bit naive in like how I was thinking but I was looking at these pro guys they're also 6'3 maybe they're 210 so they have more size more strength but I looked at it as there's no reason I shouldn't be able to put that kind of force and power into the baseball if I can move my body through space and apply that type of force in that type of time frame like those guys are doing I couldn't figure out why somebody else could do it and I wouldn't be able to do that if I could train my body to be that size, that mobility, um, move that way, coordinate that way. Like I couldn't understand why I shouldn't be able to do it if I could put together the puzzle and do all those things. And so it became like a checklist of like, okay, how strong do I need to get? How big do I need to get? What is every joint in my body? Like what are the range of motion I need to get? I was always a pretty flexible guy. I was pretty athletic. So some of that just kind of naturally was there. Um, the strength was not, the weight was not, that was for me, that was very hard. So that was a lot of the early years was figuring out how to eat, uh, figuring out the nutrition side, the training side, um, very quickly realized that running cross country was not a good approach or that working a summer job and biking five miles there and, uh, to and from to get there was not a good approach. Uh, so I made every mistake you can possibly make along the way, especially in high school. Um, I realized after the fact it would have been way easier to just find a qualified coach and save myself like 30 injuries and all this three years of, you know, up and down progress. Um, but at the same time, that's how I learned. I learned by making all these mistakes. So I can't be, I can't totally be, you know, uh, I can't totally regret it, but 
I could have made seven years of progress in two years if I'd had me now coaching me back then. So. Yeah, I mean, and all those mistakes, I'm sure, make you a heck of a much better coach because you're able to relate on so many different levels through everyone else's struggles. So with your struggles, um, and I know you've written about it, you talk about it, most good coaches talk about it, whether it's training or, well, of any kind, really, um, or any goal that you're going to have setbacks or plateaus. So what were some of your plateaus or setbacks with your entire training sphere um, that just were pretty tough, or how long did they last? Because like you talk, uh, everyone talks about, it's not a linear, straight upward um, progression. For sure. So, so my progression, um, just to give you an idea of high school, I'll just kind of go through the whole progression um, real quick. But so I started off 70, 73, about 6'3", 150, freshman year of high school. I think that was even like the end of, that was like summer after freshman year. Because I was going into sophomore year, I was like 70 to 73. Um, I ended up being about 165 a year later, touching 81. So Bare, like some progress, but again, very minimal progress for the first year of training for somebody. Like I didn't know, I had no idea what I was doing. I was doing all this cardio. Um, I started lifting the bad form, no real nutrition plan. Um, you know, I was just like, oh, I'm going to try to eat a lot of food. Well, that doesn't really work. And that's not the approach that we use with our guys because that doesn't really work to have some vague uh, approach like that. Uh, junior year, I got up to 85. I think I was 175. So very little progress again in another year. Uh, tweak my back because I was trying to rotate my pelvis as quick as possible. I thought you had to power the hips through. Um, turns out you don't I have to necessarily force that hip rotation. And so I was, I tweaked my back. I actually missed all my junior year uh, because every time I would try to rehab, I would be using the same pattern. I would just re-injure my back. Um, fast forward to senior year, I was 180, 185 pounds. Um, figured out the back issue to some extent. Uh, ended up being... 83, 85, touch 86, 87, uh, having a pretty good year, no college offers. Um, I didn't go to any showcases my junior year or my senior year because I was, had missed the year with a back injury. So I was basically like this no-name kid who had no offers, nowhere. Um, I naively believed that I had to play Division One or my career was over, um, which, again, it ended up working out for me, but it could have easily that, – that was a mistake. Um, I, looking back, I would have – probably preferred to play um, at a school where I would have had playing time from the start and gotten to develop a little bit quicker. Um, but I, again, 83, 85, touching 87, uh, no offers. I decided to pursue a degree in exercise science. So that year I started looking at, uh, this is my senior year of high school, started looking at colleges that ranked well for that. Uh, applied to a bunch of them, ended up choosing Maryland. Um, again, didn't have an offer to play at Maryland, but I was committed to go in there as a student. Uh, one or two months before that fall semester at Maryland started, uh, I went to the baseball summer recruiting camp. Um, we all know they're not really recruiting camps for, in general. Like there might be one or two kids that were personally invited there that aren't paying, um, but it's, it's a, it's a moneymaker for, you know, the assistant coaches and it's, it's not really a recruiting camp. Um, they kind of mark it as an instructional camp. So I went into this camp with the mindset that I'm going to make the team, which after the fact, I realized like that doesn't really happen it wasn't a walk on tryout. It was literally just a recruiting camp. Like you don't just go into a recruiting camp and make the team, but I didn't know that. So I walked into the camp thinking I'm going to go in this camp, you know, that paid 400 bucks for the camp. I'm going to come out and I'm going to have a spot on the team, which was like completely ridiculous to go and think that. Um, but I went in, I had a great camp. Um, Eric Backage was the head coach at the time. It was second year. He's now the Michigan head coach and he's pretty well known at this point. He was at Vanderbilt before he went came to Maryland. Um, you know, I, I went out, I had a good two innings in the scrimmage. I was sitting 85. I think I struck everybody out. Um, I came in after the two innings. He came up to me. He was trying to make me nervous. I talk about this in my book. Um, he tried to make me nervous. He said, if you can go out and strike out the next three batters, I'll give you a spot on the team. And so, like, looking, I think he was trying to make me nervous, but I wasn't really, like, registering what he was saying at the time. I just knew, like, certain days you have it, and you're like, I know where the ball's going. I, I feel good. I just – Hitters aren't necessarily like division one hitters at that, at that tryout. Um, so yeah, went out there and struck out the next three batters and he came and took my hand and said, you have a spot on the team. Now, again, as cool as that is, like it wasn't, it's not like I came in and was an impact player. Like I was basically the worst player the first year or one of the worst pitchers that first year, everybody was throwing 88 to 92 or, or harder. I was here throwing, I regressed a little bit. I was like 81 to 83 that first fall. Um, 
so it was very much a fighting and clawing my way just to stay on the team. Um, you know, really didn't get much playing time my first three years, but every summer I was using that as an opportunity to get playing time. Um, I would make some progress through the year, and then every summer I would just see this this huge spike where I could I really got playing time. I got to I got to improve a lot over the summers. Um, so again, it was it was not a linear process. It was up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, sophomore by sophomore year, I was up to 89. Junior year, I hit 93 a couple times. Uh, then something clicked my senior year. That's when I really started to figure out how to use my lower half. I was always kind of an arm action dominant guy who didn't know how to get into my legs. Um, so something clicked. I was then uh, 91, 94, touching 95. And so now I finally had a, a real role in the team. Um, so yeah, I was, I was somewhat of an impact player that year. I think I could have been much more of an impact player, but we had seven guys touching 95 in that bullpen. So we were, we were loaded from that standpoint that year. We had some, you know, full scholarship guys ahead of me that were sitting 95. So uh, I had a good year, you know, low one ERA most of the season. Uh, we ended up going to Super Regionals, lost to Virginia in three games, and uh, they went on to win the whole thing that year. But the cool thing about that story is that I actually got drafted in the middle of our third Super Regional game. So our assistant coach runs down to the bullpen. We're playing on TV. We're facing Virginia. And he runs down to the bullpen. And I know the draft is going on, but no one knows what's going on in the draft because we're in the middle of a Super Regional game. And he runs down. He tells me that I just got picked in the 15th round. You know, congratulations. And I just remember that being, like, total weight lifted off my shoulders. Like, I actually got – I actually pitched the next inning after that. But it went from, like, being nervous for that outing to, like, okay, deep breath. Like, there really isn't any pressure here. Um, so I, I remind myself of that moment sometimes. Like, there isn't the, – the fat, that feeling of this pressure just lifted off your chest. Um, I think we put way too much pressure on ourselves outing to outing sometimes. Um, you know, realizing every outing is really an opportunity. Like, if you have the worst outing of your life, like, you still get to go home, go to bed. Like, there's going to be another day. It's, it's not the end of the world. But that feeling of no pressure, this is just an opportunity to just go and show what you've got and just attack it and what's the worst that can happen. Like that feeling is what I remind myself of that moment um, very frequently. So oh, that's, and, that's you know. yeah, that's an awesome story. I love, I love reading about it. I love when you sometimes clip it up and portions of it and post it back out there and hearing about it again. It's, it's an awesome story. And I think there's new details to pick up on every time. Um, one of the things I picked up, I, don't know if, I think it was in my notes. I might be able to tag team here. Uh, I lost it. Eh, we'll skip around anyways. So uh, what was the question? I'm just going to pause here because I can edit this out. It was something about your college. Oh, real. so real quick, what pitches were you throwing? I'm curious about that. I'm some, sure some guys are curious about that. So I was mostly a fastball only guy, believe it or not. Um, so I'm a sidearm guy. Uh, deception movement. Um, I would say I'm closer to like a Josh Hader type as far as like oh. kind of weird low, you know, almost sidearm, close to sidearm. Um, I had a little bit of a slider, but again, my focus was on not throwing 83 and finding a way to throw 90 plus to actually extend my career. And during that time, I was also trying to figure out another pitch. But uh, again, I had so many movement deficiencies. Like I had the worst mechanics coming into college. Um, so I had a ton of work ahead of me from that end. Um, I look at off-speed development as kind of the icing on the cake. Like once you can move well and you have kind of the guardrails of your mechanics in place and you have a repeatable delivery and you can throw your fastball where you want it, it's like now you actually have a repeatable arm slot to work on the fine-tuning of your pitch release. But if your mechanics are changing all the time and you have no repeatability anyway, it's very hard to take a, a non-repeatable delivery and then add on, you know, a complicated release. So I would throw a slider. I would have outings where I'd throw like – 12 sliders in a row and just strike out the side. And then I'd have outings where every slider I threw hit, a, hit the batter. Lefty or righty didn't matter. So I threw about 90% fastballs uh, my senior year. My same, same thing. I remember, my, yeah. I remember the question. It was going to be um, what in the summertime, because I know whether it's a high school senior who's committed or even a junior um, or guys in college who still have some development, whether or not they realize it, what was your summer focus? Were you playing on teams? Were you playing on some, some years and some others? And what, did you focus more on training? What was your focus on the summer in college? So my, my freshman and sophomore uh, summers, I competed because I didn't get any playing time those years. 
So I felt it was important to at least play competitively at some point during the year. I, I feel pretty strongly about that unless there's some major mechanical issue or guys kind of got a nagging injury or something like that. If you don't get a ton of playing time during the spring, I think it's important to play for at least a few month period over the course of the year. You definitely don't need to play like nine months competitively out of the year to get better, but there should be some phase of the year where you are playing. So if you're just riding the bench in college, I think you should play summer ball somewhere at a level that you can get consistent playing time. Like not, not at a team where you're just going to get like an inning every other week, but somewhere where you are going to get consistent uh, exposure, but also where you're not, um, you know, for example, the Northwoods, it's a grueling schedule. You, most guys aren't going to actually have the chance to train. Most guys aren't going to have a chance to eat how they need to eat. Um, so most of my athletes, I tell them to try to find a summer league if they can, where they're still going to be able to make some sort of progress from the training standpoint, um, where they can, as, as best as they can, kind of control their workload. So maybe they get three to five innings a week as a starter, four, four to six innings a week as a starter, or two to three innings as a reliever. But they still have time to work on some other pitches, to work on bullpens, to work on training. So I'm not a huge fan of overworking guys in the summer. I think it's you kind of want a controlled, a little bit of a controlled setting where you can still still compete but still train, um, and you don't want to, you know, overreach as well to where you're throwing like one inning every three weeks. So I, I, I within, within within like the specific focus, like honestly, it's whatever the limiting factor is for the guy. Um, if a guy's got very high pitch ability, um, but he's a guy who maybe needs to work on adding some weight, adding some strength. Um, we probably we probably are more on the side of like you need to throw just a couple innings a week and spend your and prioritize your summer working on the strength side. And if he's a guy who has no pitch ability and he's just you know he's a tank and he throws hard, well you probably can just maintain your strength and place the emphasis on getting game reps. So it completely depends on what the guy's limiting factor is. In my case, it was just getting game reps. Like I need to work on executing all these mechanic the mechanics that I've been working on in flat grounds and practice and actually do that off the mountain in the game, get experience, lock those patterns in um, and just get comfortable being a college pitcher because it's, it's tough when you get, you really don't get any game reps um, to, to feel like you, you are a college pitcher. So I, I came back after that first summer and I was like, I'm a college, like I had success in, you know, a decent summer league. I, I feel confident coming back. Yeah, for sure. What was the, this is more of a personal experience question. What was the, so two parts, the biggest difference between college ball and pro ball, talent aside, so taking the talent, because obviously there's a talent jump, but other things, yep. other factors, what was the biggest jump there? Um, and then second question, was there kind of a post-draft moment where you were like, man, this is really cool? So, yeah, so the biggest difference is that there's no one to hold your hand at all. There's literally no accountability. Um, now for someone who's been through the college process, I think they've learned some accountability. Most guys have learned some semblance of accountability. Um, you know, otherwise they don't make it through college. They get kicked off the team. They don't go to class. They don't show up to practice on time. Um, in pro ball, there's none of that. There's no handholding at all. Um, it's why I think for, for high schoolers who aren't taken really high and aren't offered a ton of money or aren't super accountable already, I think it's often a bad decision to sign out of high school because I've seen these kids, they just get chewed up by a pro ball. They start going to casinos with the 27 year olds and taking this huge signing bonus and blowing it and, you know, alcohol for the first time. And it's just, it's not a good situation if you, if you don't have anyone holding your hand. Um, so I, I think that's the biggest difference. It's, it's an easy, it honestly, it was a very easy transition for me because I went from a huge workload with school and, um, you know, writing a thesis and having to do six hours of work on like bus rides um, yeah. you know, back from regionals and stuff like this, um, to just getting to focus on baseball. Um, honestly, the jump from ACC baseball to rookie ball was like a huge downgrade, like very easy to throw it in that environment in front of, you know, there's no opposing crowd. You're facing free swing hitters that have never, I mean, it was, it was a step down at that point. Um, so uh, yeah, I would say it's accountability. There's no one holding your hand. There's no one like getting on you. It's just kind of sink or swim. Um, and then your other part, other part of the question was what? Like was what was there, there a moment that was really cool? Yeah, you were just like, you kind of stepped back, you know, after you'd been drafted at any point in time or even now working with guys too, where you were just like, man, this is awesome. Yeah, I mean, honestly, the first, like when I first heard I was drafted, like it was just a surreal moment. 
um, that's something you work for. I mean, ever since, like, again, I created that log when I was 15 years old, like, like not even like a good JV pitcher, like essentially. And I just, I said, I'm going to be drafted. So to actually actualize that. And, um, you know, I, I don't think that successful people necessarily spend too much time dwelling on those things. Like you look at Bill Belichick when he wins the Super Bowl, like you spend a few seconds or like, wow, this is really, this is pretty cool. And then it's, it's what's the next thing? Because the, the end goal isn't to just get drafted. It's to be a good pro pitcher. And it's not just to be a good pro pitcher. It's to be a big leaguer. And then it's not to be a big leaguer. It's to be a successful big leaguer that stays there. So I, I think there's a mistake. And a lot of guys think it's like once you make it in the pro ball, you've, you've succeeded, you've won. Uh, that's very much not the case. And if that's your mentality, then you're going to be one of, the, one of the many guys who gets to pro ball and then a year later they're out of it. Um, because even if you don't have that mentality, there's still a good chance you're in pro ball for a year and then you're out of it. So uh, I didn't dwell on it too much, but I did, I did take a few days uh, to kind of enjoy it, um, let it sink in, like get moved out of my uh, college apartment. I went to the beach for a day or two. Uh, then I went out there, reported, and it was all business uh, from there. But I think I personally had a huge advantage when I first got out there relative to the other first-year draft guys that I was playing with um, because I, I still took that very accountable approach um, that – we had been forced to do in college. Whereas other guys started to get a little bit loose, some of them. They would stay out late the night before, they would go to the casino, whatever. Um, and so I, I, I realized like, it's very easy to get kind of sucked into the day to day. Like there's no fans, it's easy to just like go through the motions, but I was still treating it as though there were, you know, 10,000 fans in the stands. I was still getting myself mentally in, in game mode every time. Um, guys would get distracted by the politics, right? Guys are distracted by like, okay, who's in front of me in the depth chart? The pitching coordinator's in town today. We have to impress him. Or he wants me to make this change. Like, what do I do? Like, guys were getting distracted by all this stuff, and I'm just like, I can't control any of that. I can't control the next outing if I'm prepared for that. I can't control how focused I am for the next pitch. And so I think there's, there's noise in college, but there's more noise in pro ball as far as politics, as far as everyone wondering, like, who's going to get moved up, down, like, all the moves that are being made, like, who's going to get cut in spring training, there's just more noise. Um, and so I think being able to tune that out is especially important once you make it to that point. So when you talk a lot about dedication and accountability, so how are you transitioning now to your work at Tread Athletics and um, when you work with guys? A lot of your work is remote. How do you, without a lot of the time, getting to just even really talk to the person in person, you might have phone interviews, I'm not sure, but how do you narrow down and get someone who is dedicated or is it something where you build the dedication into them or into the program or the interview process? What does that look like? What are you looking for? And how do you get it out of guys? So I, I know whenever I get this question, people want me to say some technique to like motivate guys and like get the most out of them. I don't know if I fully believe that. Um, I, so my experience just having played with hundreds, thousands of guys, you know, coached hundreds, played with hundreds, um, you can kind of tell right away which guys are, are bought and which guys aren't. I think there's relative, it's possible, but there's relatively few cases where guys just make that, make that leap from not really bought in to just fully crazy bought in overnight. That doesn't really happen. It kind of, it can happen. I've seen it a couple of times, but it's pretty rare. Um, so then I'm, you know, as a coach, you're faced with the choice of, well, do I try to motivate these guys that don't really care? Or do I just put focus on my attention on the guys that do care? I kind of chose the latter. Um, we're not handholding in that sense. So in that sense, it's more like pro ball where, um, we're, you know, we're taking the guys that care, we're taking the guys that are bought in and we're giving all our attention, all our effort to those guys. If someone doesn't, if someone signs them for the service or the dad signs them up for the service and they don't want to use it, we're not going to hunt them down and force them to follow. Like, it's just, that kid's not going to be successful. We're not going to reach his full potential in the sport anyway, um, when it comes down to it. So as far as how we get that and why our athletes are so accountable, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of self-selection, right? Like the guys who find us in the first place are, Googling how to get better at pitching. They're like online figuring out how to get better. They're searching, they're hunting. Um, they have a certain level of, you know, expertise already, or they wouldn't have found us. Like we're not the first result that comes up when you search how to throw a fastball harder. Like we're not like the first YouTube video that comes up that just like takes you through some balance point drills. Um, so just the fact that when guys find us, they've had to already jump through some barriers to do that. Um, just the fact that these guys are actually you know, they're financially committing to a program. That's proven that when someone actually financially commits to something, they actually, they're more bought into that than when you just give it to them for free. 
like when I just write a, a former, like I've had lots of former teammates, um, you know, ask for programs and it's not the same level of compliance when you give somebody something for free as when they're actually bought into that. And I think that's a little bit of a life hack for, you know, even, even me or any of us is that you can think back to your own life. What's something like you got a book for free. Someone lent you a book. You're not going to prioritize that as much as something you actually bought yourself. So it's, it's unfortunate that it is that way, but that's kind of the human psychology, um, even for you and I. Um, so when it's comes to something that I'm trying to hold myself accountable to, I do kind of look to that. Like if I, if I invest in something, I know I'm going to do it. If I just kind of get it for free, I know it's going to rank really low on the priority list. Just, uh, just that, that's how it is. So our guys, we, our guys come to us and they're already hyper motivated. They already want to get better. Um, they've already half of them seen like all our videos, read all our stuff. And so it, it becomes a very, uh, you know, a very easy process to work with a kid like that. And that's, that's the kid that works well in remote training. It's not the guy, if a guy needs someone to actually hold him accountable day to day, if he needs a coach to sit over his shoulder and count reps, he's remote training. We tell them remote training isn't going to work for you. Like dads will call us. We tell them don't sign up for remote training. Your kid's not going to follow it. It's not going to work out. We've seen, we've seen that with a couple of guys in the past. But the guy who doesn't need accountability, he's hungry, he's, he's ready to get better, and he just needs a plan. He needs someone to identify his limiting factor, give him a plan, and he can go execute it, then it's perfect. So that's why you don't need to be there. That's why remote training works. You need a hyper-motivated guy. You need, a, you need a way to assess them and get to the root cause of why they're not making progress. From there, you just need to make a plan and you need to make sure he sticks to it. But again, we already have motivation. We already have guys that are sticking to it. We're tracking everything so we can tell if they're sticking to it or not. Um, and I think that's why remote training can and does work so well for the right guy. Have you guys always done comparisons? Cause I saw in the last, I don't know if it was in the last year, you had posted about kind of comparison to, uh, guys at their same level and other levels. And is it in-house comparisons too? how do you build in competition within their tracking numbers? Um, so we are, we have general like standards that we compare guys against. So we'll, give guys percentiles, we'll rank them on base, on all their power strength metrics. Um, so I, they already know from the very, very start of their program, how their, their strength and power profiles um, kind of rank out. So, you know, maybe it's like dumbbell bench press or their squat uh, or their medicine ball shot, put, like an upper body power movement. And they can see like, oh, I'm 90th percentile in my upper body strength, but I'm 40th percentile in my lower body power, for example. Um, so they can, they're already kind of ranked from that standpoint. Uh, we also have a record board for all our remote athletes. So they're all constantly competing at each, each level, each drill, each ball weight. There's different records. So our guys are competing all the time, kind of trash talking each other a little bit on social media. So it, it gets fun in that sense. Um, obviously, there's advantages to in-person training as well. But uh, again, this is kind of where we started building the company around. And that is something that we're going to expand to in the future, uh, probably a couple of years down the road, is adding the in-person component too. So in prepping for the show, I was looking at some of the different, um, whether it's podcasts or blogs or videos that you've done. And my, my question was, before I had looked into a couple more of them, was how long until you're seeing noticeable changes in whether it's movement or, well, we'll just stick to movement. And you talked about um, just some different shoulder instability, well, not stability, um, we'll just say for lack of a better word, just tightness, tightness in the shoulder, in the pack that doesn't allow for, you know, your forearm to lay back as far and those kinds of things. And you talked about just within a couple of weeks, how talk about how it's not quite black and white with getting change in your body on um, whether it's going to be short-term or long-term. And, and the reason I asked this question is because whether it's us trying to program things or other people having questions, it's, Hey, how long is this going to take? Is there a right answer? Is there a wrong answer? Is there an exact time? Um, just talk about that and how complex yeah. movement changes. So first off, if the first if the first question that an athlete has is how long is this gonna? How quickly am I gonna throw ninety? From like I'm throwing seventy, how quick can you get me to ninety? You can instantly tell that's a kid who's not gonna succeed because he's impatient from the very start. So if, if it's if that's the attitude, is how fast how fast can I get ten miles an hour? Like you might as well cross them off. They're not going to, they're not going to be successful. What you want is a kid who's like, I will literally do whatever it takes to get this next one mile an hour or to get whatever, whatever it is, gain this next one pound. If you have that kid who's willing to do whatever it takes, that's the kid that gets and is willing to do it for as long as it takes. 
right? I knew when I was, when I was 15 and I was trying to throw 95 miles an hour, I knew I was in this for the long run. If it took 15 years, I was going to spend 15 years. And I'm almost 15 years in and I'm like, I have another 10 years that I want to, I'm going to go after this as long as it takes to reach whatever my particular goal is. So um, first off, if that's their, if that's their attitude, it's, it's not going to work out. Um, the answer obviously is it depends. So if we're talking of, about a specific mobility limitation, um, it, usually if it's tissue related, if it's a tissue quality issue, you can make pretty quick change. So if you kind of have a little excess tone in your pec minor and you're having trouble getting your arm up and back and you're having trouble getting it to lay back, and that can be linked to, for example, a couple of years of bench pressing heavy and not much back work um, and no, you know, no attention to the soft tissues, that can open up pretty quick. Like you can make pretty radical change in a couple week period um, as far as reducing kind of tone and, and tension in a muscle. Um, it's not always that simple though. But that's not always the reason guys have a mobility limitation. Sometimes there's an actual bony block or a joint restriction. Um, sometimes it's a motor control issue, which means you need to kind of build, uh, build control and awareness from your brain to that muscle or that joint uh, at that new range of motion. So there's a combination of factors that go into, let's say, restoring uh, mobility and control at a joint uh, or increasing stability at a certain area. It, it can be, you know, three to six months to see a noticeable improvement in some cases, and it can be within one session, you've already gained, you know, 10, 15 degrees in, in, a, in a joint because you've opened up tissue and that was the causative factor. So completely depends. Um, you know, our approach is basically look, look to identify whatever the limiting factors are in a guy's from a bird's eye view, right? Like what are the things that contribute to performance? Obviously how they move on the mound is a huge contributor, but within that you can divide it into, you know, mobility is gonna be a huge limiting factor in terms of getting in and out of positions. Uh, motor control, like sometimes, like in my case, I had pretty good mobility, but I just had, I had never learned to use my lower half, activate it in the right positions. I didn't know the timing, sequencing. Um, so that's kind of the motor control aspect of it. It's not just having the range and having the control like, in, you know, in the gym or on the, on the table. It's not just having the control of those joints, but now you got to be able to coordinate and sequence that. You got to learn how to hinge, right? You got to learn how to effectively kind of brace that front leg. You got to learn to hold the shoulders back as the hips go, like all these, the coordination and the actual skill of throwing. Um, you know, I like to say before you, before you can be a pitcher, you have to be a, a good and efficient thrower. Um, so that's a whole other thing. Um, can your body actually produce the levels of force and power required to be an elite thrower? And so now you're, now you're looking at, you know, their strength levels, their strength training routine. You're looking at nutrition to be able to support those strength gains. So there's all these factors that go into, you know, you look at a six, 350 pound kid, you look at me at 15 years old and you're like, how do I get from that to like Max Scherzer, six, three, two, 10, throwing 95 plus miles an hour. What's like, what's the difference? And the answer is there's a lot of things that are different. And you have to basically just divide it up into all those chunks and create a plan for each chunk. Let's he's, you know, he's strong. Like, let's get strong. How do I do that? Here's my nutrition plan. Here's my lifting progression. Um, the answer isn't always just train like how an MLB got trains. A lot of people think like, Oh, I need to like, you'll see these clickbait articles, like train how Justin Verlander trains or whatever. Like you don't need to necessarily train how a big leaguer trains because they're at this level of their progression. And so they're doing much more advanced and specialized things for their body. How you should train as a complete beginner is different. As a complete beginner, you need mastery of the basic movements, basic strength training movements. Um, you need general muscle, muscular size, hypertrophy. Like you need very, very different qualities at the very beginning than you do for such a specialized elite athlete. So that's another uh, misconception that a lot of athletes have. It's like, I need to do this specific thing that this guy is doing. Well, that's not what he did when he was your age to get to where he is now. That's just his the workout has to evolve. The training has to evolve. Nutrition evolves. I don't eat the same now as I did when I was trying to gain two pounds a week at 18 years old. You know, everything has to evolve depending on where you're at in your progression. So I have no idea if I answered your question. No, that it not only did you answer it, but it also spawned some follow-up questions that I had in here that I'm going to save for the end for our um, twins critique, because I think it all, Taylor's right into there. So I want to sw kind of switch gears and talk about nutrition because that's a big component of your book. And that was one of the um, highlights. I remember when I bought it, I just went to go look as a refresher when I bought it. It was I think December 19th of 2016. So okay. as soon as I saw it had that big con nutrition component, I was like, I need to get this because 
at that point, there had been some more programs coming out and you could find a lot more information in 2015 and 16 than you could in 2008. Um, I was like, okay, this guy really keys in on nutrition. So how important is nutrition, generally speaking, before we get into kind of some more specifics, as, as it pertains to your training, your throwing, and all the recovery components? So nutrition is, is more directly applicable when it comes to like the strength training side of things. Um, so when it comes to gaining weight, uh, maintaining size, maintaining strength, fueling your workouts, uh, it's extremely important. So if you're 150 pounds and you're trying to become Max Scherzer 210 pounds, that requires gaining, you know, 60 pounds. You're not going to do that without having your nutrition dialed in. Um, most high school kids, I'm not going to say all, but most are what I would consider hard gainers, um, where they just have fast metabolisms and they don't understand how much to eat. And if you just have them eat a lot, like coaches just tell, oh, eat a lot, eat more food it doesn't work because it's not specific enough of advice. Um, I definitely fell under that category. I would eat 4,000 calories a day and it wasn't enough. I needed 4,500 plus calories to actually gain, consistently gain weight. And so it's one of the biggest mistakes I didn't make in my, like in my high school career. It's one of the reasons that I didn't ultimately make progress. Like I remember a specific period, uh, junior year of high school where I did, I did hire a good strength coach for a period of time. So my, my programming was great. I was, you know, I was working hard in the actual training sessions, but I remember my strength numbers were just totally stalled out. And I was like, what am I doing wrong? Like I'm working hard. I know this guy's good. I know what I'm doing is the right programming, but I was stuck at, I think 175 pounds, like six weeks in a row made very little progress. And I was like, I eat, I'm eating a lot, like every meal, I'm eating a lot of food, but it's not, you can't be subjective about it. What you have to do is actually, get nitty gritty with the details and measure it. When it comes to nutrition, I think the biggest thing we'll take away is if you're trying to change your body composition. So if you're trying to gain weight, you need to be in a calorie surplus. That simply means you need to eat more calories than your body's burning. Like if, if nothing, and this is what we talk about in the actual, in the book is, you know, I, I spent a lot of time studying, uh, you know, kind of the, the natural bodybuilding world where their whole sport is based around, being able to manipulate their body, being able to make, manipulate their body weight, their body fat levels, their muscle size, muscle strength, that's their sport. So any of those guys who kind of figure out, figured it out and know what they're doing, um, they have to have that down or, you know, they're, they're not going to be successful in their sport. Um, and so that's kind of what I studied in terms of, and then applying it to the baseball community where there was, this wasn't talked about, like even in college, like we had a dietitian that you know, consulted with the athletes and the advice was like, don't eat fast food and add a serving of fruit to every meal. It's like, that's not bad advice in like on the surface level, but it just, it just confuses, it confuses people. So what I did is I basically put it into a hierarchy or a pyramid. It's like, okay, there's a lot of factors that are fall under the umbrella of nutrition, but we need to organize those in terms of priority because if, when they're not organized, the athletes come to us and they're like, well, you know, should I be taking creatine like to gain weight? Like what, what brand? And like, they think that's like, that's the question they're asking as though that has any importance at all in terms of the progress they're going to make. So it's like, okay, let's first get calories under control. Calories are the very most important thing. If you're not in a calorie surplus, which again is different for everybody. If you're a slower metabolism guy, you might gain a ton of weight on 3000 calories a day. If you're a fast metabolism guy, you might need 5,000 calories a day to gain weight. If you have a high body fat, you might need to lose weight. You might need to eat 2,300 calories a day for a while. But, but the calorie, the caloric balance is what determines that. That's the very most important thing. The next thing that I go over in the book is the macronutrient breakdown. So what are the composition of those calories, right? We all know that just eating marshmallows isn't going to give you favorable results. You're going to gain weight if you eat 5,000 calories of marshmallows. But we know that that's not the only thing that matters. So the next most important thing is the breakdown of those calories. Uh, all calories are consist of protein, carbohydrates, and fat in some combination. And so it's explaining how that matters. You don't need 800 grams of protein a day, but you also need, you need protein. It's important. You need carbohydrates. Those are also important. Those fuel your workouts. You also need some degree of healthy fats. That's also important uh, for healthy, you know, hormonal function, things like that. So if you get those two things right, that's 90% of the battle right there. Like if nothing else, if you just eat enough calories, and you have relatively balanced macronutrient breakdown of those calories, like that's most of what actually goes into fueling as an athlete for performance and getting to your goals as far as like gaining weight or losing weight or manipulating your body composition. 
And then all these other things are kind of extra details, which may help a little bit. Um, you know, meal timing and frequency. When exactly do I eat my meal after the workout? How many meals a day do I eat? Like these are all things that have some impact, but it's very, very minor in the grand scheme of things. You could eat two meals a day and still make great progress compared to eating eight meals a day. Like very, very minimal differences um, when you look at the research in terms of the actual results. If you get the calories equivalent and you get the macronutrients equivalent, there's very little when it comes to meal timing, meal frequency, uh, supplementation, um, micronutrients, hydration. Um, again, these are things that matter, but how much vitamin D that you get in your diet, you know, isn't as big of a contributor to your performance. It's still important, but placing it in order of priority is what most kids who have no base of knowledge about nutrition need to hear. Eat more calories than you're burning and track your calories. Now track your body weight. As your calories go up, you're going to see your body weight go up. Like you start there. And once kids grasp that, then you can start to get a little bit more complex. But at the end of the day, it doesn't need to be more complex past how I break it down in the book. Um, I don't know if you saw uh, Trevor Bauer just did an interview with Michael Lorenzen or a podcast with him like yesterday, like two days ago. And they were just talking about like, what are some things that you think are, you know, overdone or what are some things that you've kind of like cut out a little bit and Lorenzen's like obviously, you know, jacked, he's big into nutrition, strength training. And his answer was actually like, you can go way down into rabbit holes with nutrition. So it's for him, he was saying like, I've actually cut back and simplified that a lot because you can expend all your mental energy trying to follow exact supplement protocols and timing things perfectly. Um, you know, buying every last thing, organ I'm not saying organic is bad, but like buying every little last thing perfectly that you possibly do and spending all your energy and effort on that. Or you can get 99% of the results and simplify it. Um, and so he mentioned like he basically simplified his diet and like stopped spending all his, spending all his energy trying to pinpoint that. Um, so again, once you get to certain levels, the, the focus should change. Once you've built a strength base, like you don't need to spend every week focusing on gaining more strength. Once you've built the body composition that you want, you don't need to spend all your effort worrying about nutrition. Like my nutrition is in maintenance. It's very, very simple at this point. My strength training, I do just enough to maintain my strength at this point. My, my training focus is completely different. It's power, speed focused. Um, but yeah, to get back to your question about nutrition, like it's extremely important but it's going to vary depending on the guy, a hard gainer like myself. It's probably the most important thing. It's the limiting factor. I, we coached a, a guy, Antoine Kelly uh, over the past two years. And he went from six, four, uh, 165 pounds, touching 92 out of high school to a year later, he was 205 and he was 95, 98. Went in the second round last year. He's 215 now. Um, for him, that was the limiting factor. He had never trained before. He had no idea how to eat, uh, how to eat for, uh, for size or how to eat for sport. And so, you know, he moved perfectly. He already had a throwing pro. Like he had all these other, every, almost everything. He was the cleanest movement screen we've ever had. One of the cleanest that I've ever seen, but he had a very clear, that was the limiting factor for him. But then there's other guys who are naturally more mesomorphic. They're, they build muscle easily. They naturally have a pretty good appetite. Their parents have kind of cooked real meals for them so they know breakfast isn't like cereal um you know and a glass of orange juice like they they understand the basics and they put on like for them it's not the limiting factor because like and i played with a lot of these guys in college like they'd never really trained but they came to college like 195 pounds pretty lean like it took me five years to get to so so the last thing on nutrition let's take a 17-year-old, this is a pretty common thing I see, and, and I have this conversation with guys, and we do track, but just a general 17-year-old who, <clears throat> hard gainer, he started tracking his calories. He started eating more calories. He's getting up to kind of where he thinks his mark is, but he's also in season for basketball, two to three hour practices, and can't seem to figure out why he's losing weight and not gaining weight. What's the hard truth that he needs to hear? So I've obviously coached guys like this in the past and as much as I can, I try to convince them to drop basketball because it's <laughs> almost impossible to, I mean, you can do it, but I don't lie to them that you're going to be maximizing either sport. So then it's a matter of like, okay, what's the, what's the goal here? Is the goal to play college baseball and be the best baseball player possible? Or is the goal to like, just be a well-rounded high school athlete and, you know, move on from then and just be okay. Like, 
kind of be behind the eight ball once you get to college. Um, it depends on the guy, right? Like I've had guys who like, they were the, they were the star of their high school, like football or basketball and baseball. And yeah, I couldn't talk them out of it. And they were okay with the fact that they were, you know, going to be a little bit behind once they got to college for baseball and they were okay with that. And so the goal for them was they'd usually lose 15 pounds every basketball season and try to scramble to regain it uh, over the next six months. And the goal was basically maintain weight. And it was the athlete I'm thinking of, it was a chore for him, but he was able to maintain weight. So he didn't, he should have gained 10 pounds over that time frame, but at least he didn't lose 10 pounds. Um, so really emphasizing like just because you're doing a lot of cardio, it doesn't mean you have to lose weight. It just means you're going to have to work extra hard to replace those additional calories that you're burning. And so what I would tell them is, look, you got to bring some sort of food, some sort of calories to your basketball practice. Like, I don't care if you have to like drink a 500 calorie drink, just sip it through practice, uh, like a whey protein, dextrose, uh, you know, mixed drink. Um, just sip that through practice, eat a couple of peanut butter sandwiches right after. Like, okay, you at least replaced 1200 calories that you probably burned during that, during that period. Um, but we just, we offset it with additional calories. So that athlete would normally need 3,800 calories to gain weight. He's probably eating 4,800 during that period of, of basketball. And it's difficult because you've just added another three hour block of the day where he can't be eating because he's training. So now you have to eat more calories, but you have less time in which to eat those calories. So the scheduling just really has to be down. They have to get up early, eat breakfast. Um, it's very hard to eat 5,000 calories or 4,000 calories, even in like a very condensed window. If you skip breakfast and your, your eating is between let's say noon and 9 p.m. Like that's very, very, very difficult because you're trying to digest and process all this food and wait for your next hunger response to kick in over a very condensed time frame. If you go from let's say 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., like you have that long of a feeding window, you have time to eat breakfast, let your body digest it, naturally get hungry again, eat a snack, digest it, get hungry again by lunch, eat it, digest it, be hungry again for a pre-workout, uh, you know, and during workout shake. Like you, you let your body naturally do its thing if you space those meals out. Um, it's not that it's necessarily better all else equal. If you studied it, like if you ate 4,000 calories in two meals versus six meals, it's not that one is going to show it's better. It's that, have you ever tried to eat 4,000 calories in two meals? It's almost impossible. You're force feeding yourself. Um, so for, from a practical standpoint, spacing your meals out makes a lot of sense if we're trying to gain weight. And most, most athletes don't realize that, but again, if they're playing basketball, you have to track. It can't just be try to eat a lot of food and let's see what happens. You're tracking your body weight every day. You're tracking your calories every day. If you lost weight, you didn't eat enough calories that week or you're really dehydrated. So weigh yourself first thing in the morning after you're urinating, it, it accounts for the hydration level to some extent. Um, but if the trend is downward, you're not eating enough calories. And the answer is you have to increase your calories. But the bigger answer is you should probably consider if you wanna play basketball in high school, if your goal is to play college baseball. No, that's perfect. I'm going to cut that up. And when we have that conversation, I'm going to send it to because we've, we've got one of your pages or maybe it's a couple pages from the book um, posted on one of our bulletin boards for guys to have context to compare themselves to different levels and body weights. And then I kind of explain what lean body mass is and all that. And yeah, the, the hard truth is it's going to be hard. Um, you need to track. And yeah, I'm, I know our, our president, Jason, is probably watching this. Loved that answer, I'm sure, with you saying so, you need to quit basketball. So I don't know if you've seen it, but we actually came out with a, a free weight gain, like three week weight gain program. Um, yeah. Yeah. But the point of it is, again, it's a lot of overlap with what I cover in the book. But the point of it is basically like when I was 15, 150 pounds, like I didn't really know what I was doing. If someone had just like come up, slapped me in the face and said, like, read this. And then they showed me those like 20 pages and they walked me through basically three, two, three weeks of how to properly track your body weight, your calories, what's important, what's not important. If someone had just like been a mentor for three weeks, I could have taken it from there. I could have been like, okay, well, I just gained five pounds in three weeks. Like I understand what, it, how much effort this is going to take. I understand what matters, what doesn't, how to track. I have the tools now. I could have taken those tools and, and taken it from there. But no one ever did. It took me four plus years to like piece together everything. Um, anyway, we put together that, that free program. And it's basically like, like, so we'll work with teams sometimes. And we have the coaches hand this packet out essentially to their players first day. And it's basically just slapping them in the face. It's a reality check. It's saying like, look, you're not going to be the player you want to be if you don't take nutrition seriously. That's, unless you're just a genetic freak, you're already 
ripped 200 pounds, like coming in, like, unless you're that guy, nutrition is your secret weapon. And so it's kind of slapping you in the face that like, this is, this is the real deal. Here's what you need to know. And here's what you have to do to get there. Um, it's not a hundred percent of the details, but it's 90% of the important stuff right there. I couldn't agree anymore. I did see I had one comment oh, talking about because of time, I don't want to get too into the weeds on this, but can you talk about back slash, po slash post foot placement? Toes inward, straight, or outward? Does it depend on the athlete and why? Uh, yeah, so this is something that, uh, you know, it took us several years to really figure out and understand. I'm not going to say that we have the perfect answer for everybody. Um, so long story short, athletes have different hip anatomy, hip structure. Some athletes have what are called retroverted hips, um, and some have antiverted hips. And basically it, it refers to the amount of room and the, the orientation of your femur in the pelvis. So in other words, some athletes have a very easy time internally rotating. Like for me, me, for example, I've got a ton of internal rotation, right? Like very good internal rotation on both sides. Um, and then relatively poor external. Like this is amount, this is the amount of external rotation they have. Some guys can just get that foot all the way up here very easily. They can sit, they can sit Indian style cross-legged. Um, and then some guys are the opposite. They can just sit in that catcher stance, like knee to knee and don't, don't even feel a stretch in their hips. Um, some guys are in between and they have pretty decent range of motion both, uh, both directions. But the point of that is not everyone is going to throw the same way. Not everyone is going to uh, create that linear move towards the target in the same exact way. So, you know, we hear the term like vertical shin angle for the back leg. But then you look at all these big leaguers and some do that and some don't. Right? The guys that have almost no internal rotation, like Justin Verlander, he's got a very vertical shin. And he's in the more of an externally rotated position as he drives towards the target. He is basically, he is much more here as he moves towards the target, but he's holding that knee back and he's more, he's, he's using the external rotation that he's got, but he doesn't have hardly any internal rotation. And then you look at someone like Edwin Diaz, Fernando Rodney, um, Michael Lorenzen, like you look at guys that have good hip, hip internal rotation. And so a lot of them, that knee starts going a little bit earlier. But again, they have the range of motion to do that. And for them, staying in more of an externally rotated position, it's not going to feel as comfortable. I know for me, when I try that, you know, on the surface, it feels okay. Um, but then I look at the numbers on the gun and they're all down three, no matter what. Even if I felt like the throw was good, like but my body doesn't like producing force that way. And so there is an aspect of trial and error when it comes to how you want to orient and use the lower half. I mean, that applies to everything in the delivery. Um, there's relatively few absolutes. And so one thing that will, when you're not sure about some, you know, one or two factors, like if, let's say you're playing with two different leg lifts, or you're playing with two different foot positions, or you're playing with two different hand positions for a specific guy. Um, a tool that you can use is basically split testing, right? It's just like, okay, well, let's test both, but I don't want you to necessarily know which is better. So have somebody, you know, radar gun you uh, blind, like you don't see the numbers, they see it. Throw five at 70% one way, throw five at 70% another way. Try to be very, you know, impartial in how much effort you're putting in and then see. And a lot of times what you'll see is one very, very clearly wins. Like one, one foot position is like plus four on, or plus three on every single, like usually it's like every single throw is one way or every single throw is the other way. Um, and so that helps over time. Like you can, you basically do that process anytime you have a, a feeling or reason to make a change, you test it first. Like I have uh, big leaders that I coach and I'm not going to be the guy to just say like, Oh, this doesn't look good on video. So we're going to like, I think we should change it. I'm just going to make that, that call. No, like we're going to test it. We're going to test it. We're going to see how comfortable it is. We're going to see how it affects your strike throwing ability. We're going to see how it affects your velocity readings. We're going to test it first. And so that's kind of the preliminary process. Um, if you have a guy where he start, he's put stays way out here when he starts and you're, thinking about making him even with the rubber or even turn him in a little bit it's very easy to test just split test it and see how his body likes to produce uh produce that linear move obviously you can have all these all sorts of flaws regardless of the foot position like no matter what position your foot's in you can still jump off your back leg and ruin sequencing so it's not as simple as just looking at that variable um but in general guys with good hip external rotation um do better with that vertical shin angle and in general, guys who have really good hip internal, 
do better kind of a little bit. I'm not going to say super early, uh, super early rotation, but they have a little less of that vertical shin position as they move forward. And then guys who are somewhere in the middle, it can, it can go either way. Um, I think the vertical shin for those guys tends to be a little bit more repeatable for a lot of them. So I, I tend to try that first. Um, I know for me, when I, when I keep a vertical shin, I do feel more stable on my back leg. I do feel like I can stay the heel a little bit longer. Um, I just don't get the same power and my numbers just, just tank. So at the end of the day, it's not about what you think is right. It's about what actually gets the result for the athlete, even if, it, even if it's counterintuitive. I got a follow-up question I might ask you when we get off here because I want to get into the last component. Um, so the last thing is, like I told you earlier, it is called our Twins Critique. It's something that we ask everyone on here, kind of an ask the expert. So it gives me a chance to kind of tell everyone who's watching who maybe isn't exposed to or doesn't know about our program. So the Indiana Twins, it's from age 8U all the way up to 17U, and our college guys come back and they get the opportunity to train as well as they need it. And the two biggest things for us are, number one, we all speak the same language. So if you're a college guy returning, you're going to recognize most of the language, aside from what has evolved from, you know, when you were back in high school with us. Our coaches, our instructors all get kind of, we just started this year our first, like our 1.0 version of our coaches certification. So we're all speaking the same language. It's kind of all written out. We've got videos that we watch. So we all understand the same thing. <clears throat> the second thing is we basically offer everything under one roof. So whether it's mental training, performance training, well, you know, whether it's lifting or any variation of performance training, pitching, hitting, catching, infielding, outfielding, all of that is all under one roof. You're going to get it in our 18 to 20 week off season program, depending on the year. So within the 18, 20 weeks, one program might be a four week weekend thing. Um, our hitting, pitching, mental training, and performance training is all 18 or 20 weeks. And within that, I mean, that's just our big thing is to be able to offer that and all for the same cost of what you're going to pay at pretty much any other organization. So, so 18, 20 weeks, or it's, it's, it's not necessarily year round. Like, are they, are they with you the whole year or are they only with you for that specific training period throughout the year? So trials are end of July minus this year, obviously transition a little bit, but um, end of July historically. And then they've got a couple months off. We've pretty much put the kibosh on fall ball or at least strongly recommend they don't play fall ball. And then we did a fall with very light throwing of any kind to cover some of our infielding that stuff. We did a fall program and then really things start to pick up more middle end of October all, all the way leading into March. Um, so 18 to 20 weeks, depending on how on the calendar works out. So that all into there. So our biggest struggles to give you more context are we've got 180 athletes. We've got guys traveling for two and three hours away or two and three minutes away. So some are there once a week, some are there three times a week. Some miss for three weeks, some miss for two months, some don't miss at all. So from a standpoint, it gets really difficult. And we've asked this question, question more specifically of a lot of guys with um, how we can evolve or improve our assessment. Some guys say, hey, just assess once a year. Some are like, hey, just kind of assess as you're going. Other people will say, you should be assessing every month or every six or eight weeks or 12 yeah. weeks. So within all of our constraints and what's going on, what would you see as kind of the best way to assess our guys compared to maybe how you might do it? So as far as a formalized assessment, it's you have to find the balance between like too frequent and it's just very time consuming and you're always assessing and then too infrequent and you don't know if what you're prescribing is actually working. So that's kind of what you're finding the balance between and it depends a little bit on your resources and what's practical. Like if you're only seeing them for an hour, three times a week, you might not want to dedicate one whole session every month for that. That might not make sense. Um, but if you're with them three hours a day, six days a week, then it might make more sense to, to assess more. Or if you have plenty of staff to do that, it might make more sense. Um, I think it's important to realize that watching athletes move is an assessment in and of itself. So just watching them do their warm up, watching them, you know, if you have an athlete with an ankle mobility issue, you can, you're seeing his squat form week to week to week to week. You're seeing if it's improving in real time. So you don't necessarily need to reassess, you know, an ankle rocker range of motion assessment every week uh, to see if he's making progress in that. Uh, movement is, you know, a, is a, an assessment in and of itself. 
um, you're seeing guys throw. So if you're working on their, you know, their pec tissue quality, working on that ability to retract, um, like retract the scap, you're seeing if that's manifesting itself in their throwing mechanics week to week. You're seeing how that their movement is evolving in terms of their throwing in their, all their lifting movements. So you can pick up on a lot of that without having to formally assess all the time. Um, we will assess generally every three months. Uh, sometimes we'll, we will wait six months at the longest before doing a, a formal reassessment. Um, but we are looking at their mechanics on a weekly basis. So if, if an athlete's not making progress on a specific mechanical factor that we know is linked to mobility, then we're, you know, we're kind of tipped off way ahead of the fact. We don't have to do a formal reassessment to know like, okay, well, he's still not, he's still not uh, being able to hold the T-spine back when he throws. Um, and we've given him a certain thoracic rotation corrective, but clearly it's not working. Like what's going on here. And so then we'll, we'll be able to kind of focus in on what's the issue here. Like what? And so a lot of times you don't have to do the formal reassessment to be able to see what is and isn't working because at the end of the day, we're trying to influence an athlete's movement on the mound first and foremost. And we're so from that standpoint, we're assessing every week. We're seeing how that's affected every single week. Does that make sense? You're, you're doing like media assessments every week in that standpoint, but you're doing large formal assessments every three to six months. No, that's some really good insight. I appreciate that. Is there anything else that you want to add real quick? Um, I guess, well, I guess let's just lead into where can people follow you? Where can people find out about the book, about the training offering? Go ahead and let everyone know. Yeah. So trainathletics.com. Uh, again, we have a free, uh, free excerpt from the book. We have a free weight gain program. We've got a free metric analysis tool. You can plug in your height, weight, age, level, position, your squat, deadlift, you can plug in all your numbers and it's going to give you a ranking on, on where you're at. What are some of the things you probably need to start focusing on? Um, again, we have the, the, the full ebook for people that want to check that out in the nutrition section. Uh, we've got dozens of blog posts breaking down every little aspect of mechanics. Uh, thousands of posts on Twitter at Tread Athletics, Instagram, Tread underscore athletics. Um, we're posting pretty much every day and we interact with everybody. So we'd at me if you have a specific question and uh, we pride ourselves from a customer service standpoint. When anyone has a specific question, emails us, like we give very detailed, specific responses to everybody that emails in. So um, it's not one of those things where if you email us a question, we're just going to say like, thank you for inquiring with Tread Athletics. Like you will get an individual response and we will take care of you. And, you know, we hop on calls very readily with, with athletes who are interested in training or interested in getting better. Um, you know, that's kind of what we built our brand around because we weren't this huge name starting out. We were no name people that, you know, we needed to build the reputation that we have by, and obviously, you know, like customer service is everything. It's not, if you, if you have a good product, but you can't provide good customer service, it doesn't really matter. So, you know, we do everything we can to be as helpful as possible. You know, I think one ad, uh, you know, one advantage that we have is that all of our coaches are still, you know, relatively young. We're either still pursuing our own careers. We have a, number, a couple of minor leaguers who are still going after it, uh, myself included. Um, so we're still in the hunt ourselves. We understand like, look, these are kids dealing, you know, we're dealing with dreams here. We're dealing with kids that want to play in college. We're dealing with guys that want to play professionally. Like this is not just providing a service. This is way more than, than that. And, all of, our, all of our coaches rather have been through injuries, surgeries, struggles, ups, downs. It's not like just guys who were the star on every team their entire careers. I think the best coaches tend to be the ones that had to struggle, that got hurt, that um, you know had to fight for it, that had ups and downs. So I, those are the coaches that, you know, every single time I've been hurt, which is many times, every single time I made a mistake, um, you know, you learn, you hopefully learn from that and you figure out what can I do better or how can I use my experience to guide the next athlete that I come across that has, you know, has an elbow surgery or, or has a shoulder injury or whatever. And so you use all these things to make you a better coach. And that's kind of the culture that we've tried to adopt here. No, I completely agree. I highly recommend all your guys' services. Um, if, if you're looking for someone that has extreme dedication, look no further than lanky lefty in the forums and the amount that you were tracking I mean it was almost I don't know I just I, it was blew my mind so it's impressive and, and I just see with the amount of content that you guys put out what content you put out your book everything that you do is so incredibly detailed and well done so I highly recommend I can't speak any higher about it so no, I appreciate that, that. yeah so with that said I guess we will end this one and 
everyone tuning in. Ben, I'll have you stick around for a minute after, and we will talk to you guys soon. Awesome.